I like the word conditioned rather than determined because if everything is predetermined, then it, it just feels like there's really no possibility of awakening in that. You know, because we're, we're just bound by past causes. So I think it's possible to understand that things are conditioned by various forces. And that different conditioning leads to different results. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. It's great being together again here on Maui. Uh, we don't see one another that often. No, we but don't. Uh, I, he- I hear of you often from all our friends. Of course, it brings back a lot of memories of when we first met uh, in Bodh Gaya in India. Uh, people were saying Ramdas was coming. I had no idea who Ramdas was. <laughs> I had been in India, you know, for a few years then in Bodh Gaya. And I think you first came there in 1970. Yes, I and came. with the hordes. <laughs> so I, I had been in this really nice, quiet. We we uh, we had uh, places here. What do we call? Actually, it was a buffalo shed. Buffalo shed, <laughs> and he tried to meditate, <laughs> and. I uh, had to uh, had to have parties, <laughs> <laughs> and I would be banging on the wall. Quiet there. <laughs> uh, that was the beginning. <laughs> was the beginning of a great friendship. <laughs> we brought uh, then uh, then uh, Burma. Yeah, Burma was. Yeah, we shared candy. <laughs> <laughs> we were both there with at the monastery with uh, Saira Upandita, uh, who's a pretty strict and demanding teacher. Uh, but somehow you and he got on. <laughs> you got on really well with him. I don't think he was as tough with you as he was with me. That's what the, the, you were so so. Potential. <laughs> Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, I think I think maybe it was an age thing. You know, you were comrades. <laughs> <laughs> but when Ramdas left, he left before I did, so he had this great stash of candy, <laughs> of M and M's, which I inherited, uh, which was great. But, that got me through some hard times around this. Good. So, <laughs> appreciating it. And more recently, he's been my meditation teacher. There's another story I kind of have to tell about our relationship because uh, in a fundamental way, you were the, uh, I'm not, the impetus for the whole Vipassana movement in the States. So first, when I, when I first came back, and you, oh, I'm sure you don't remember this particular story. incident. Well, there were a couple, but when I came back from India, I'd been there for about most of seven years, you know, back and forth a few times. I had no idea what to do. You know, it's, this was all of my 20s was in Asia. And so I came back, I was 30, and I wrote to Ram Dass. I had no idea. I had no, no profession. Mm. So I thought, I wrote to you and said, what do you think about teaching Buddhism in some college or something? And Ramdas just wrote me this brief note back, basically saying, don't even bother with that, you know, and 
kind of got off that track. So I started traveling cross country and wanted to see Ramdas in California, where he, where you were staying. So I get there and I call, and this was a day that the master was keeping silent, and he wasn't speaking to anybody. Okay, and we were buddies, you know, in India. We were good friends, I'm not speaking to anybody. So I'm walking down the street in Berkeley, I need to go to the bathroom really badly. Go into one restaurant and ask if I can use it, no. First, after India, I was totally shocked that they would say no. Go into a second restaurant. Can I use the bathroom? No. <laughs> Go into a third restaurant. There's Ramdas sitting. <laughs> and we get to talking. Because when I showed up, he was willing to talk to me. And then he invited me to teach at Naropa, you know, that first summer in 1974. Uh, and that was the beginning of everything. You know, when you and Trunkle were leading those big classes. And you and Jack and you and Jack got together on that. Yeah. Yeah. But it was teaching it was teaching the meditation sections of your class. Yeah, well you were. Yeah. 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 And there were thousands of thousands of people there. And it was out of that then those people started inviting us to teach retreats and the whole the whole thing came oh, from that. It's, <laughs> oh, you, it's all your fault. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a close connection with how it all unfolded. If I could, uh, how you've, you've helped me with Maharaji. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but Maharaji, Maharaji is here, uh -huh. and Maharaji, he watches over you, you know? I hope so. <laughs> I could use watching over. Yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting, because when you left on the bus from Bodh Gaya with, with all those people, uh, you know, and that's how a lot of our friends met, first met Maharaji, I just had decided to stay in Bodh Gaya and keep sitting, so I never had that... I never had that fateful meeting. Yeah, fateful meeting. Yeah. I'm very intrigued with the concept of no self. If I understood one of Joseph's recent lectures from the perspective on no self, suffering ceases. Joseph describes dukkha as anything that is conditioned, unreliable, insecure or impermanent and therefore incapable of leading to lasting fulfillment. Taoism has been a huge influence and an important part of my practice. From the Taoist point of view, human, human being is nature and as we align with her rhythms rather than resist, resist them, we get stronger, happier, and healthier by going with the flow. The literature describes the path to follow as human being follow the way of earth, yin. Earth follows the way of the heaven, yang. And heaven follows the way of the Tao. Joseph, could you speculate, is there a relationship between no self and Tao? Ramdas, is there a relationship between love and Tao? I, uh, that's quite a question. <laughs> yeah. the, the good one, the first one, uh, no self. In some way, I think it's using uh, different language to describe something uh, mm -hmm. very similar. Uh, because really, the, one of the, as you well know, you know, one of the meanings of the word Dharma is nature. And so connecting with the Dharma is connecting with nature. And the notion of self is itself a construction which gets in the way of following the way of nature. 
And as was expressed really simply, uh, I think it was by a Sri Lankan monk, although I've heard it now from many people, no self, no problem. You know, as long as we're kind of contracted in the sense of self, then we're out of the flow of nature. So I don't see any, I don't see any uh, dissonance at all with, you know, what was described as the Taoist approach and the sense of selflessness or emptiness of self. In fact, it seems the same thing to me. Uh, see, I have gotten in, in, in my bhakti way I've gotten to soul and uh, we die into a soul land it's my mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And we don't die, only the ego dies, and the soul goes on and incarnations and all that. Now, how does that fit? Well, you know, it's, as we know, Buddhists generally don't use the word soul. I know, that's, <laughs> like, that's like a no-no. <laughs> However, <laughs> since we're on Maui, <laughs> I wonder what it would be like, for example, just in, in the way you're describing your experience, whether we could, it would be the same thing to say nature as soul, you know, to die into the nature of the unfolding and so we can, it's so easy to get caught up on a word yeah that was, uh, that's right uh, it's words it's words you know in, in, at one point uh, I was at this Buddhist Christian conference at Gethsemane uh, uh, and after that they wanted to get a group of Buddhists to write a commentary on the rule of Saint Benedict. So they, they asked four of us to go through the rule and just from the Buddhist perspective. And in one of the discussions, and uh, Brother David Stendhal Ross was there. Yeah. In one of the discussions, we came to a place, it was very interesting for me. Of course, he uses the language of love, you know, and, it's, yeah. and he's very full of love. Uh, and as I was listening to it, to me, it was describing the same thing that the Buddhists use the word emptiness for. And I just saw emptiness and love being the same thing. How can they be the same? <laughs> because emptiness really is empty of self. Oh. You gosh. know, and so when self is gone, oh, then there's no separation. And then you go into well. Yes. Wow. If there's no self, there's no other. No self. No other. They, then you enter into emptiness. Uh, that's what I was. Uh, hmm. The empty. The word emptiness uh, got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you you definitely chose. The better word. <laughs> I mean, between love and emptiness, uh, let's say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take emptiness. Uh, most people, you know. You have, been, you have the better PR word. I empty, I, I empty you. <laughs> but if you take the I and the you out of it, <laughs> then there's just love or just emptiness or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> That's what unconditional love. Uh -huh. yeah. It all seems, and this goes back in a way to the first question, it really goes back to kind of some realization of selflessness. Selflessness. Yeah. Which yeah. could be another word for love. Yeah. Yeah. Selfless. Yeah. 
Maharaji loves me, and I love one more mm. than people, and love and love and love, and it goes from heart to heart to heart to heart. It's 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 catchy mm -hmm. now. Uh, Emptiness is not may not be so catchy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it is catchy in a way, because <laughs> when when I've been with you know really some of the great masters who really felt empty of self, who just felt that they yeah there was just no one there. Yes, being in their presence, it, you kind of did catch it. In a way, you know, yeah. could, their presence could lead you into that space. Yes. Uh, so I think, but you know, as I think that's right, uh, because uh, the Maharaji is nobody there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Maharaji is full, full of love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he is a soul. As my, mm -hmm. Therefore, it's a uh, it's a mirroring of my soul. Exactly, exactly. I, I've had exactly the same experience yeah. with some of the really great teachers. Like all <laughs> their emptiness. Would reflect my neurosis. Yes, <laughs> that's what I, that's, you know. Yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> and it just and it became painfully obvious. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, you know, there might be. A, I think there is, or there might be different flavors, yeah. you know, to how people manifest this. So. That emptiness. When, when, uh, when I've come on uh, masters, I often, I often reflect on my 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 a dharma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah what does the word dharma finally mean i i actually like the the translation of it as nature or, or lo the, the lawfulness of nature, or the way of nature, or just how things are. But the, the tree out there is a, the tree is dharmic. Well, it, it's manifesting its own nature. You know, in and you could talk of it in terms of, you know, the physical elements or the life force in it or. But it's just, it just seems everything is nature, in, including our minds. And that's, I think that's what people often don't see. They don't see, they don't see, they don't see the self is nature. Yeah, and it's, you know, we get so caught up in our stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I was just speaking with, just a few days ago, I was speaking with somebody who's going through a difficult time in a relationship and kind of their partner was, at least from their perspective, not behaving very well in, yeah. in the situation. We st I started just, and this is somebody who's very even deeply practiced, so... Uh, and just started talking about the behavior 
not as sort of not as something so personal, but as delusion acting itself out. Delusion. Yeah. Delusion. Like delusion manifests, you know, in a certain way. It manifests as confusion and of not knowing. When delusion is the mind, is in the mind, so that the nature of what happens is confusion. So that if I said about that person, uh, their karma, this is their karma. Well, so you could, we could, I think, we could say they are creating karma, but you know, in in the quality of their actions. But the fact that they chose to do that action, right? They were they're from past karma. Well, this gets into a very tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we just finished teaching the three-month retreat. And so toward the end, and this question invariably comes up at least once. What about free will? <laughs> is there free will? Or is it all determined? Is it all conditioned? Is it all past karma? Uh, so I just... I reflected back that I had been having that conversation since I was a freshman in college. <laughs> the free will determinism question. <laughs> but at, at least from the Buddhist perspective, not everything that happens to us is a karmic result. That that's only part, that's only one of the causes of things. That there are other causes as well. What do you say about free will? I say that <laughs> I can say a lot. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm gonna. <laughs> Mostly, what I say is that when I really investigate the term free will, the words don't mean anything together. For me, it's, it's a it's a phrase that's been used, but what would free will mean? It, it <laughs> the very term implies an agent that somehow is not conditioned by anything. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it just doesn't. It, it's like for me, it's a meaningless term that has taken yeah. on that's a huge. <laughs> become a huge philosophic problem but well forget the word free okay <laughs> uh, if I decide to do something it was free will but uh, decide to do something right. and it wasn't is it wasn't it, it may be to be de determined or, well, or not. I, I like the word conditioned rather than determined because if everything is predetermined, then it, it just feels like there's really no possibility of awakening in that. You know, because we're, we're just bound by past causes. So I think it's possible to understand that things are conditioned by various forces and that different conditioning leads to different results. So that's one of the things, you know, I, that I appreciate about the Buddhist teaching in particular, because he gave such a clear map of the mind and of what conditions what, you know? And so he said, yeah, if, if greed will condition this kind of suffering, or love will condition this. Well, uh, that bus from hmm. Bodh Gaya to, to uh, wherever you were going. <laughs> wherever you were going. <laughs> 
and I saw a thing I thought on the bus. Danny came up from the back and said, why don't we turn right mm-hmm. because it's a, a, a very spiritual place. Mm-hmm. Or we can go ice cream <laughs> by, by going to... Uh, we were going for ice cream. And I was ice cream... <laughs> Holiness. 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 (laughs) So finally, the bus driver said, we ought to have to go one way or the other. (laughs) And I was really uptight. And uh, I I turned right. Uh And, and, And we turned right. And Maharaji appears. Was, <laughs> yeah. appears. And he then took us to Dada's home. And, and uh, they had started early at night, mm. early at morning. Uh, they started cooking for mm-hmm. 25 people. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, what is that about? Now, the, <laughs> well, <that's> a, <laughs> you see, yeah. that's li- yeah, I live in that. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's a realm <laughs> way beyond me. <laughs> so I can't really say much about that. Yeah. Uh, but I can I can imagine a mind that encompasses time, you know, in that way. And so it's not uh, I I don't have any I don't have any mm-hmm. disbelief in that. Um, but then the question is, how does that fit into this question of whether yeah. things are predetermined yeah. or not? I was sitting in that bus, uh, deciding, uh, deciding. That was my free will. Well, sometimes I think there there are forces which are conditioning things that we're not seeing. Mm-hmm. And, yes. And so I'll give you another. The story I'm going to tell is much less dramatic, but it's it's a little bit in the same vein. So I had gone to this first time I had gone to India to look for a teacher. And I traveled around to different ashrams and you know, wasn't connecting with anybody. So I was in New Delhi about to buy a plane ticket to go back to Thailand where I had been in the Peace Corps. You know, okay, well I'll just see if I can find a teacher there. Mm. So I'm walking down the street to the airline office And at a certain point, some force stopped me from taking another step. And I'm not like you. I don't have these kinds of experiences. (laughs) You know, your life is full of them. For me, this was very strange. I mean, it just, it it felt like a physical force which just kept me. So I was very kind of, you know, what's this about? So I turned around, went back decided somebody had given me in New Delhi some acid. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go to Benares. You know, I, can't, I can't get to the airline office. I'll go, I'll go to Benares, I'll take the acid. Go to Benares. Uh, we, are, we were on this uh, little houseboat or something. Anyway, didn't take the acid there. I'm in the train station to go back to Delhi to try again to go to Thailand. Yeah. And the thought comes, well, maybe I'll go to Bodhgaya and take the acid under the tree, under the Bodhi tree. So instead of turning right, I turned left <laughs> you know, to Bodhgaya. Go to Bodhgaya, there's Munindraji. There's no whole thing. So it's kind of the same thing in some way. Maybe, you know, there are, seem to be forces guiding yeah. what's happening. So I think there are, you know, I, I think. There can be mysterious forces at work. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't your mind. No. It's certainly not my conscious mind. Yeah. You know, it's, 
Um, yeah. So I have a favorite mantra, and it, it's. <laughs> this mantra is really the resolution and answer to all these questions. Ready? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? You know, maybe Maharaji knows, but I don't know. <laughs> and it really, you know, with a lot of these questions that are just beyond. Be, yeah. beyond the realm of my understanding, rather than have an opinion about it, you know, about something that I really don't know, I found it really freeing to just, well, yeah. who knows? It's, uh, uh. So when, you know, that first, that summer we were at Naropa, I think it was the first summer, or it might have been the second, Dujam Rinpoche came. Uh, to give talks, and you know, he's this, he was this great Tibetan enlightened master. And in one of the posters of announcing his talk, it said he was the incarnation of Sariputra, who was the chief disciple of the Buddha. Now, from the Burmese perspective, where I had been immersed for 20 years, Sariputra was not reborn. <laughs> you know, Arhans, enlightened beings, do not take rebirth, for sure. But there's Dujam Rinpoche, it, it, you know, he's a great master. <laughs> and it says, incarnation of Sariputra. So my mind went on tilt. You know, impossible. Yeah. But the, and that's where I realized I, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, all I could say, oh yeah, the Burmese think this, the Tibetan think that, that's all. And it was so freeing, you know, not... To, to feel that I didn't have to have an opinion? Yeah, about that. About what I don't know. <laughs> so, it seems obvious in retrospect. Yeah. I've been, uh, yeah. There, there was a guy that told you the story. This, this, this the guy, a uh, guy was um, walked in front of me and he said, um, you're the guy that talks to your dead guru? <laughs> I said, yeah. I, I, I liked him. But he said, well, that's your imagination. And I said, that's great. And it is, it is my imagination. Because Maharaji can go, if he can break into temples, he can break into <laughs> my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I, I live in the world that is defined by my imagination. Mm -hmm. Then when I was a, a social scientist, I was defined as a logic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, define? Well, I, I think... It, in the West, people, our, our, our culture basically, I think the scientific culture yeah. is, is, is basically materialistic, N not, not in the uh, pejorative sense, yes. you know, but just that the material world is yes. the basis of reality. Yes. And I think from a, a more Eastern perspective, whether you know it's Buddhist or Hindu, or, but more generally in the East, I think there's much more understanding of the, you could call it mind or big mind or awareness or whatever, that's much, that's a much bigger experience bigger than field. material, yeah, bigger field. Uh, and so for me, I, I kind of, in my better moments, I'm much, more, I'm much more connected with my, that experience of mind. And that's where, in some way, I, that's where the term emptiness helps me. Because it's just, 
It's like empty, empty. Op empty. openness, or empty. and in which anything can happen. And, and so, in a way, you know, from one perspective, everything is an appearance in the mind. Uh, but the way that person was using imagination, he, I think he was using the more materialistic senses. Oh, this is just some electrons in the brain or you know, neuron, whatever. Yeah. He's using it in a materialistic way rather than in the oh, I see. openness I see. of yeah. uh, awareness. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Could you ask Maharaji to? Hmm? Could you ask Maharaji to make an appearance in my mind? <laughs> could you put in a good word for me? <laughs> Although I did tell you, yeah, I did mention that recently. It did come to mind in a very vivid way, but it's not usual. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're very psychically, psychically attuned, psychically open yeah. you know, to that. Yeah, I think I am too. Yeah. yeah. In the light of the of recent terror attacks and deeply troubling politics. How does one develop a real compassion as we get polarized into us and them? I get that question a lot. It comes up a lot. Yeah. And it came up once in particular when I was teaching a retreat just after 9-11, and we were teaching metta, you know, love and kindness, and getting to the place, you know, where you send it to first your benefactor and friend, then to the enemies. Yeah. And there were a lot of people from New York on that retreat. And they said, there is no way that they were going to send metta to, to, those to those guys. I mean, it was just... And so it was a really challenging, it was really challenging for me to really, and it took some time. I, I, it was after the retreat was over and I was really reflecting, well, if metta loving is really universal, what would it mean in that context? Because their response was completely reasonable, you know, understandable. Well, go ahead. Yeah, well, <laughs> what I came to was That even in that kind of situation, one could have the wish for people to be free of hatred, to be free of all enmity. Yeah. So there's nobody who, would, who we would exclude from that wish. Yes, yes. So again, it was just reframing the language to, to say, oh, may you be happy. That's not the right words uh, no, no. for that situation. <laughs> no. But there are words that encompass, you know, the non-separateness. Yeah, sure, they are. that's uh, all. Uh, uh, yeah. But to be compassionate to them. Yeah. I see in my uh, my um, soul language. Mm. I um, put um, George Bush on my <laughs> uh, my puja table, and I didn't like him. And. Uh, I've got a John Bain on stuff like that. <laughs> you have a whole, a whole array of... Uh, <laughs> among which, uh, well... <laughs> uh, 
And I sat and took a look for that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I looked at that picture. And what I saw was this, that soul, that soul was had had a lousy incarnation <laughs> and and I could feel compassion for that soul mm -hmm. yeah well in a way it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of in and this is I I think this is what you're saying, or something like it, of, of kind of seeing the delusion of the mind and how it manifests. And you can have compassion for the delusion, you know, the, of somebody caught in that mind state, you know. And then, that, say, we're talking about my mind or no, George No, Bush's? George Bush's mind. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, you have to speak for your own mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but how you were looking at George Bush reminded me, it's like you were seeing, you know, yeah. when you say he was caught in a lousy incarnation. So in the Buddhist language, you were saying, yeah, kind of an, an incarnation caught in a lot of delusion, you know, and then acting from that place. So I think it's, it's the same, the same possibility. How would a, a Buddhist incarnations we uh, nothing. No, yeah. Souls are incarnated. Uh, uh, from my point, you tell us. Tell me what. Uh, right. right. <laughs> 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 Just so everybody knows, we have been having this discussion <laughs> since 1970. So what's that? That's 30, 45 years. <laughs> We've been having this very discussion. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> okay. So, so in the in the soul language, yeah. So it's the language of a soul reincarnating. Yes. In Buddhist language. It's each moment conditioning the next, conditioning the next. So there is a lawful unfolding to the process, just like if you plant a seed in the ground and it germinates and sprouts and, you know, becomes a sapling, becomes a tree, bears fruit. From the Buddhist perspective, there's no one element that is in the seed that is carried over, but rather it's a process of become, the seed becomes this, becomes this, becomes this, becomes this. So, if one wanted to kind of synthesize these two languages, one could say, I, I don't know whether this is something you would say or not, but that soul is this unfolding lawful process that continues from life to life. You know, one could use the word soul to describe the process. The conditioning. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that it's lawful, that yeah. it's not chaotic, it's not random, that yeah. each yeah. moment conditions right. the next, so there is a lawfulness to the unfolding. Uh, Souls are not unlawful. There, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, since, I, since I'm not quite sure what a soul is, <laughs> can't really say. You, I couldn't even. I couldn't even. Uh, no, I'm hopeless. Anything. 
because I see a wall. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, I kind of see different language. You know, and, yeah. And, and, and I do come back to kind of in terms of ultimate truth. I really take refuge in who knows. <laughs> you know, who knows. But it, for me, it's the who knows not of confusion, but just of trying to stay open. And just, okay, there's, there's so much that I don't yet know. Yeah. And so instead of crystallizing a view, just, well, let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that I don't know, this actually would be an interesting question for me to ask you, because I've noticed that in myself, I'm much less, I could say, attached to or dogmatic about my views than I was earlier on when I was younger, and even teaching. But the whole relationship to the teachings and to my views has really uh, eased up a lot. You know, and it's more like, okay, well, let's yeah. just see. So I'd, I'd be interested, in it. when you look back to your early years of teaching, whether you see a difference now, you know, and yeah, how you hold things the from then. Difference, it's just, just difference. Mm -hmm. A person comes up and they say, we will, uh, we will listen to your lecture, da, 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 da. And I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that, uh, that completely different. Yeah, yeah. Completely different. So an interesting question is whether it's wisdom or age. <laughs> maybe, maybe. The two are mixed a little bit. It's mixed. It's mixed. It's mixed because with age comes the, the, the a perspective, mm -hmm. including uh, your own life and just a whole experiences, all the experiences. Boy. And you see, you see those, those motives. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, even when I think back to the early years of our conversations, it's like we used to argue these points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now that seems ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perceptual difference. Mm -hmm. You have tuned in to the perceptual difference. <laughs> what has been the value of continuing this conversation for 45 years to you personally? The, the value has changed. So in the beginning, the value was in trying to convince him. <laughs> so kind of being right. <laughs> Now, it's totally the joy of the connection. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's a vehicle of connection. That's all. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, this, this, this is where it comes down to love. 
It comes yeah. down to love. Or right? emptiness. Yeah. Or emptiness. Yeah. Depending it's on your empty, perspective. It's empty, it's empty. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to keep it, you know. <laughs> uh, do you want to lead a meditation? I'm really it. No, I'm a new leader. You're the elder. The elder. <laughs> 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 And I'll, <laughs> I'll put in my two cents. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't mean that. <laughs> Go inside. Way inside. Way, way inside. Inside where emptiness and love play. Let your consciousness Play with these two terms. Add freedom in. and peace. In your inside, your inside <sighs> you will experience those those aspects And let's not forget joy. In you is joy.
in you is compassion. Peace. Emptiness. And love. Those are all in you. In you. Now manifest them. in your behaviors in your thoughts All these things are the one are the one the one lives inside you. How about becoming that one?
if you become that one and I become that one, it brings us so close together. That is the ultimate of relationship. Namaste. That was beautiful.